when they have said you cannot trust rationality, you cannot trust your senses and perception, then what do you trust? Well, I know it. There is something that is born within you. I'd like to thank our top sponsors, Jared Fountain, Anders Berge Christensen, Adara Ryum, and Fergus Ryan, as well as our top sponsors who have chosen to remain anonymous. Is there an inevitable cycle that civilization is doomed to repeat, merely reenacting the fall of ancient Rome? Or can we break free from it? The biggest hindrance to a rich culture is the rejection of empiricism. Today, you are supposed to just accept the narrative, a certain signifier of the mystic phase we are currently living in. But history shows us again and again that we are not doomed. Sometimes one man is enough to turn the tide. My guest for the evening is a returning guest the Norwegian philosopher and editor of Civilization magazine, Karl Korsnes. Welcome back. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be back. It's a pleasure to have you here. And since you were here the last time, you have published this beautiful little thing. And it's not a little thing. It's a beautiful big thing, actually. Yeah. Uh, I think when you were here the last time, you were planning to start a civilization. You are online, first and foremost, and now you've gotten to publish your first edition on paper. Yeah. It's, um, uh, we have been for about a year. It's mm -hmm. a web magazine, and it focuses on classical culture and philosophy. Uh, and uh, sometimes we also take uh, uh, or we discuss some of the issues that are in society, but we lift them up to a philosophical level. Right. So discussing the ideas behind what is happening, and uh, for instance, and uh, because I noticed, if I may just interject, yeah. um, one thing I really noticed, and I found that so uh, such a beautiful thought. You said when you uh, when we are going to to make this magazine, it should be something that can be uh, sort of not dated. Mm. You can read this in twenty years, fifty years, and you can really learn something from it. Yeah, we have removed. All, uh, all traces of, uh, of our time. So um, we, we, have, uh, we have planned to maybe hide some magazines somewhere so people can find them in 200 years uh, and it will be just as relevant. So they might be, maybe they will think it's a new magazine. Yeah. Uh, and, um, and of course, the, the idea behind that is uh, that there is a value of making something that is uh, relevant and uh, has a value for a longer period of time uh, than just here and now. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, that's, I love also this, you know, you have these magazines from like 1890s or 1920s or 1940s even, uh, uh, late 1940s, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that you can find and you can buy like the whole that whole year of that magazine and you can go into it and, and just find amazing stuff because you know it was published in a p period where they had certain uh, criteria of the sort of the intellectual content of it. Mm. Yeah one of our uh, inspirations for the physical the printed magazine is the American magazine uh, uh, Horizon. Right. And uh, uh, I would say, although I really admire what they did in Horizon, uh, which is a culture magazine uh, that uh, is really valuable to read today, but we have managed in uh, civilization, in civilization, to make it even more uh, long lasting, I would claim, because uh, there are some traces of. Uh, the time when Horizon was made, right? Uh, but there should be no traces uh, there. The only, the only trace I would say is that 
um, on the front page. Right now, it's uh, as you see, it's uh, a painting by uh, Molly Judd, uh, an Irish painter uh, of the character from Dostoevsky, uh, yeah. Raskolnikov. Yeah. And it's such a such a marvelous painting. Uh, and so that is the only trace from um, uh, the present day is that we will have a painting on the cover uh, by someone that is yeah. uh, living today. Right, because that is also a really important thing to understand. I, uh, you know, that's just sort of a little bit of a sideline here. Uh, that's my beef with the typical conservative critic who is you know, concerned with culture. That is all about making PR for what they do not like, mm. right? And they don't say, well, look at this amazing thing going on here. And we'll, I mean, we'll get to why we have these images uh, uh, or this, the centerpiece and these images here um, uh, in a couple of minutes. But, but uh, they are so concerned with just sort of negative PR and you are avoiding that. Yeah, wholesale. it's, um, it's um, the goal of the magazine, both online and the printed version, version is to offer an, an alternative. So uh, it's not offering an alternative if, if you focus on uh, what is negative uh, about, uh, for instance, like modern art or something, mm. and uh, saying how silly it is and everything. Right. Mm. Uh, that's not an alternative, it's just complaining. So uh, uh, we are interviewing and um, uh, showing paintings and sculptures and everything from uh, people living today and the buildings that are being built today that are in the classical classical realm. Yeah, and for example, you have this uh, one article about uh, a Norwegian sculptor, Torbjörn Schultzik. Yes. And I have to say, I have have actually exhibited together with him a couple of years ago. Mm. Um, so that is one thing, and he has his own gallery now. I mean, like museum slash gallery. I've actually yeah. never been there, and you cooperate with them. Yes, and we do. I think that is also one thing that that is so amazing with civilization: positive attention to positive things yeah. going on now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We we, uh, we do have a very good uh, collaboration with. Uh, it's called TBS Gallery. Mm -hmm. uh, for Tore Björn Schelsvik, yeah. uh, his name, his, yeah. uh, and um, of course at the gallery there are a lot of his works, but they sometimes have exhibitions of other uh, works from living uh, painters and sculptors, and uh, we're actually also uh, producing a play, uh, a theater play at the gallery right. in about a month. You want to say something um, about that, or is yeah, I, uh, very short. It's uh, yeah. it's in Norwegian, but uh, it's uh, a play by uh, Odd Nordrum uh, called "The Last Days of uh, Immanuel Kant," uh, and um, uh, uh, your previous guest uh, Christopher Hivju is assisting uh, the co-editor of Civilization, After mm. Nerdrum, mm. and uh, Adara uh, Rium. Uh, so they are producing this. Uh, play and uh, it's really unique because this is classical theater it's mm. not uh, it's no bullshit it's uh, classical theater that are being put up so that's another of the efforts that uh, civilization because that's one of uh, civilization cooperates with TBS gallery as yeah. the producers yeah and uh, that's because another... that's where it's being staged yes right? yeah right uh, so that's ah. uh, one other uh, activity that we do to lift up the alternative of uh, 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 classical uh, culture because uh, theaters in Norway today uh, are in a miserable state. Generally. Yeah, and, I mean, and that's uh, if you want a, a, a second challenge, stage something by Ibsen, please. Please let us see what Ibsen actually wrote mm. so we don't see a, a director showing that he or she is modern so that she can get more state funding mm. because and i uh, you mentioned um, i mentioned other uh she had a really nice article on that uh, when it comes to to staging plays and you know show us what they actually wrote mm. not our time but what ibsen actually did and i think that's also a 
uh, a misunderstanding with Ibsen because they talk about his contemporary dramas. Mm -hmm. But if you compare them to the more so-called historical dramas, I would argue that these so-called contemporary dramas are more timeless because he goes into the to the actual you know, timeless uh, uh, conflicts between people, right? So you can get fooled by the so the um, uh, the context, mm. right? Yeah, yeah. It's um, uh, it's definitely something missing is to try to um, portray the eternal aspects of Ibsen, mm. which are mm. really present in his work. Right. That is, that's what makes Ibsen great, mm. not uh, the so-called uh, uh, messages, political messages or... Uh, right. Uh, yeah, because yeah. That, that's the thing. I mean, uh, I have to be careful not to drift off into some yeah. sort of a pet sentence uh, thing for me. Uh, this whole thing about how theater is being used as political propaganda. I mean, Ibsen has been used for, like that several times in in a um, sort of propagandistic or, um, uh, effort against uh, the conservative side in, mm -hmm. in politics but um let's let's keep the focus on civilization here yeah. because that's what, what, <laughs> what we want to build yeah. um i don't know is, is there anything else you want to say like about the the general goal of a civilization uh what you want to highlight are you, do you have plans for an english version like stuff like that Future plans? Well, our, uh, our plan is to publish uh, uh, physical editions uh, twice a year. Right. And um, in, uh, in the beginning, it will be only Norwegian. Right. Uh, and uh, as we build up the Norwegian audience, and uh, um, I am, I'm certain that there is a big audience oh. uh, there. Uh, yes. Because there are, I would say, maybe, maybe a hundred cultural uh, magazines in Norway today mm. uh, and uh, or yeah 200 or 50 I don't know but none of them offer an alternative right. because everyone is about the what you have uh, learned at uh, at your uh, education your art education and uh, uh, everyone when they are established they say that they will offer something new mm. but they don't Right. And, uh, uh, well, we claim the same thing, but that's... Uh, but you do. <laughs> yes, but we do. Because there, there is a lack of uh, portraying what is happening in the classical world. There, yeah. Norway is actually, uh, uh, thanks to uh, especially uh, the Nerdroom School, is actually a center, uh, a world center for classical uh, painting. Yeah. And people don't know in Norway and worldwide, what is happening? People do not have uh, a door into that world. What what fantastic pieces that are being made right. today. And uh, there is no magazine that actually portrays that in any way whatsoever. Right. And uh, so that is why civilization is an alternative. Yeah, and I have to say, um, sort of getting to the overview of our our uh, main topics this evening, um, it has struck me that, you know, uh, well, maybe I should talk a little bit about the wall uh, before we go in to get into that. Uh, I mean, the centerpiece here is uh, Greek relief in double yeah. sense of the term. You saw that coming, right? <laughs> Uh, <clears throat> and the reason it's, it's, it is there is that we're going to talk about this man here to the left, Franz Brentano, mm -hmm. a Swiss-German philosopher. He was German, I think. Yeah, it's, yeah, because he yeah. ended up in Switzerland. Yeah, but he passed away in Switzerland. Yeah. Yeah. And he was very concerned with Aristotle. Mm. And uh, we've had Aristotle on the wall yeah. for our previous conversation. So I guess you could say he represents the Greek culture. So we thought that would be fitting. Mm. And um, this is his idea of uh, the four phases of the history of philosophy. Yeah. How things tend to develop one phase going into the, uh, the other. And I'll let you explain that in a couple of minutes. And then we have uh, some really good news here. Mm. Uh, well, may, actually, maybe you can say what this is. Yeah, that's... <clears throat> I, um, 
I was made aware of that uh, building through the Facebook page, New Traditional Architecture. That's an amazing, amazing page. Yeah. And the, only, only good news. Yes, only good news, yeah. just as civilization. Yeah, yeah, yeah. right. And um, uh, yep. that's, uh, that's the building for uh, agriculture in the Russian city of uh, Kazan. Right. And uh, it was built, if I remember correctly, in 2006. F finished in... Yes, finished, yeah, finished right. in 2006. Wow. And uh, it's just a marvelous building. I mean, and, we, uh, this is a side view, but I mean, I've seen the front view too, and it's yeah. enormous. Yeah, and it has a, a, sculpt, a sculpture of a metal tree in the, uh, in the middle. Okay. Uh, and uh, it's, wow. it's really a beautiful building. Wow, and that, I mean, that is so amazing. Uh, I think I got into new traditional architecture because I think Erde Nordrum tipped me of that, or maybe I produced, I'm not sure. Anyways, um, having one place where you really get all the good news, no, look at this modernist architecture, but look at this fantastic little church in a town behind some mountain you never heard about, or mm. this great building here, or just some uh, high-rise uh, sort of apartment building or whatever. It's all over the place in all parts of the world you yeah. find that, but it's not being you know, uh, mentioned in this, well, mainstream uh, cultural uh, media at least. Mm. Right, so, so this is the wall that we have today. And uh, I think, should we just start with Brentano? Yeah. Sort of a little overview, I mean, <coughs> sort of segue into it. How on earth did you find Brentano? Because he was quite new to me hmm. before you talked about him. Yeah. Or, um, I didn't know about him, I should say. Before. No, he's, uh, he's, uh, he's one of the philosophers that are in the valley of shadows uh, he's uh, not that known um, I can just make a transition uh, from civilization to, right. to Brentano um, Please do. it's um, uh, because just one other important point about uh, civilization and that is both online and in the physical magazine that mm -hmm. we are uh, really attempting to uh, include philosophy in the magazine and discuss it in a way that is relevant to people mm. and um, it is um, one of our goal is to make philosophy an important part of the discussions of the questions of today as it used to be right. but now philosophy has become very much uh, within the academics and right. uh, there is uh, many nice things that are being done but it's it has lost the relevance to many people. So when, oh. when news are uh, uh, talking about deeper questions and important issues, they are uh, interviewing sociologists, uh, economists, and uh, state, uh, um, like, uh, not polit or of course politicians, but people who have studied political science, um, and, but never philosophers. Right. And if they sometimes in interview philosophers. They usually say something that is more in the branch of sociology or something. Uh, so, so it has philosophy sort of written itself off from, from practical relevance? In many ways it has, unfortunately. Not philosophy itself, but the people that practice yeah, yeah. philosophy. Yeah, that's a nice distinction. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I'll be ashamed of that, saying that for the rest of my life. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> uh, no, and um, um, yeah, so um, uh, I, I lost my thread now. Uh, Sorry. Uh, no. You're no. making it re relevant. Yes. Making uh, uh, philosophy. Whether it has lost uh, the relevance. Um, in many ways, because in, um, in when you study philosophy today, it's very much about knowing what certain philosophers meant so you can you can take a phd and you get yep. knowledge in what did nietzsche mean in his later period according to this and this and i make my tiny little contribution instead of actually trying to answer questions such as how do you live a fulfilling life how uh, do you run a state properly 
uh, how do you make the best painting? So uh, that is what we are trying to uh, do, also include philosophical texts that are actually dealing with things uh, or matters that people uh, care about. Right. So uh, uh, we have uh, texts about uh, what, uh, what is a civilization, a text by uh, uh, Roger Scruton, for instance, right. and uh, also a text on what is the meaning of uh, sculpture and painting, right. um, the meaning behind it. Um, Do you want to, can you give us some bullet points on Scruton before we get into Brentano? Yes, um, the bullets uh, bullet points on Scruton, uh, and uh, he is actually one of the philosophers that, uh, when talking about aesthetics, he's the one that, as we have talked about before, he can go into the trap of talking about uh, the modernist right. art, yeah. what he doesn't like, and it ends up being a commercial for right. uh, things he doesn't like. But in this text, it's a very nice text. It was the last uh, last text, uh, last speech he held before he uh, passed away. Uh, and um, he talks about what civilization is and uh, Western civilization, and he points out the openness of the Western civilization, that you actually can have a difference of opinion and you can discuss it uh, in a way that you actually try to reach a result and try to make something better. Mm. And the reason why he says that is because Western civilization, that term has become something that is uh, experienced as offensive in a way right. by many. That, oh, Western civilization, why should we defend the Western civilization? And right. he says, well, because it is so open, because it is, uh, it allows for improvement. Yeah. And um, yeah, it's a, it's a very interesting. Uh, I mean, a simultaneous translation of the last sentence here is what we're talking about is something open, generous and creative, which is called a civil civilization. Yeah. So it's for everyone. And, and to make the transition then uh, from this importance of uh, including philosophy into questions of today, mm. that's, uh, I would say, one of the, uh, the four faces of philosophy by uh, Brentano is one of the issues that deserve more room in the public, uh, to the public, to actually discuss in what phase are we right now? Hmm. Uh, what are the phases of philosophy? How do thought evolve? Uh, and um, yeah, so that's... Um, so it's, I, I was thinking, my suggestion is that if you would explain what the different uh, uh, stages are, theoretic, practic, skeptic, and mystic. Mm -hmm. And then after that, we can sort of just sort of associate wildly about whatever yeah. comes into our minds. Hmm. Yeah, I can, um, I, I forgot to answer your uh, question about how I got into Brentano. So I can, uh, I can do that first and then right. uh, explain the four phases. Um, uh, the first philosophers that caught my interest when I started uh, studying philosophy, uh, not reading it for myself, but studying it was the many of the existentialists I found very interesting. Jean-Paul Sartre uh, and Heidegger, Merleau-Ponty, mm -hmm. uh, maybe because they actually addressed issues that were important to, uh, to human, uh, to people today. Um, or not today, but that are relevant to uh, people. The human being, yeah. <laughs> yes. And um, then especially Heidegger caught my interest. I thought he had some really interesting uh, ideas. Uh, for, for example, um, there, there was one philosopher at uh, Berkeley, uh, Hubert Dreyfus. He used Heidegger's philosophy in talking about how, uh, how one has a different kind of understanding when you are coping with something. That was how he used it. Mm -hmm. And um, this way of explaining experience, going into depth about how you experience something, I found very interesting. Um, so he, for instance, I will not go too much into that, but he, for instance, says that when you're driving a car 
it's a different way of learning when you uh, it's a different way of thinking and perceiving when you learn how to drive that is a more input output way of thinking but when you have actually learned it and you master it you think and perceive in a totally different way mm -hmm. because then the car becomes an extension of yourself in a way it's uh, it's a different way of thinking um, and I, I just found those kind of questions very interesting and um, but then I found weaknesses with Heidegger's philosophy because one of the goals of philosophy I think is to investigate as much as possible so when you have some kind of answer to a question you should always try to find out well why exactly do i uh, have the base for uh, or if if you depart from a certain base and say well this is how it is and therefore you have my theory then you should try to explain why you have that base right and that was something i think heidegger was uh, not that good at he just said well this is how it is you have something that is uh, he called it present at hand and uh, yeah a different way of understandings but he didn't explain as i could see why it was so so then i uh, thought I, I have to read his teacher going back and trace back where did this come from because i think the uh, the end result was interesting but where did it come from uh, he just claimed it and then i found edmund husserl uh, who was his uh, uh, teacher very interesting philosopher um, and uh, wrote my uh, my thesis on him and everything i found him very interesting and um, he has affected a lot of people. Uh, Sigmund Freud was one of his, uh, uh, or he attended his classes and the idea of the uh, subconscious can be traced to Husserl. Uh, so very interesting philosopher. But unfortunately he writes uh, not very clear. He is uh -huh. a kind of, uh, he writes more complicated than he ought to do. But he's a very honest uh, philosopher. Uh, so then I thought, well, I have to research where does it come from, many of the uh, theses that he had. And then Brentano was Husserl's teacher again. Right. And uh, do you know who Brentano's teacher was? No. Aristotle. <laughs> because he, he wrote, uh, not officially, of course, but uh, he wrote that since philosophy today and he uh, uh, worked in the 1800s uh, since philosophy today is at such a low point i cannot find any teacher to that is worthwhile studying therefore my teacher is aristotle right. and he was obsessed with aristotle and studied him uh, thoroughly and uh, then I'm, I'm still in the process of studying Brentano. So I'm uh, uh, in, in no way, uh, as we have, uh, I, I think I mentioned it the last time, that to me it's interesting to discuss the ideas and not to define as I belong to Brentano or I belong to this and this. So right, right. having the need to defend everything that he ever has said. But, <laughs> uh, but he uh, then very early in the process, I found these four phases of philosophy because that was one of the first thing I read was that he needed Aristotle as a teacher and because philosophy was at such a low point. But then I thought, well, why is it as a uh, at a low point? And the circle there uh, or the cycle is the answer. Hmm. So what he's doing is he puts the uh, theoretic face at the top and the mystic or idealistic face at the bottom. And he thinks that he ex uh, that philosophy at that time was at the mystic phase. Right. And he also then explains, so the circle is to explain how do you get from the top point where nature and experience is your guide. Uh, empiricism. You, yes, empiricism. Yeah. You 
use nature or you observe nature and from there you get theories. Yeah, because that, that's one thing which is a bit confusing because I would think uh, practice, which is sort of a degenerate level, yeah. that would be the word I would use for that first level. Okay. Where you are sort of, you are actually relating to reality mm. and not just inventing stuff, right? Yeah. Well, I will uh, try to explain uh, how uh, how uh, I perceive the practic uh, right. phase. Uh, but uh, just to finish that, uh, the theoretic phase is the empirical phase. And that is when you have nature and from the observance, uh, uh, observation and testing of nature, you get theories. Mm. Right. And how do you then end up at the complete opposite, the mystic phase, where theories are supposed to shape nature? Right. Ideas are supposed Just to shape the nature. So the, the cycle there is the explanation on how you turn it all around. Right. And can I yeah. just interject one thing? Because as far as I understood, uh, an important thing f with the theoretic phase, uh, the empirical phase, is that you don't have any, you're sort of, you're not moralistic on b behalf of what you find, that this shouldn't be so or whatever. You, you are actually accepting the results that you, that yeah. you come across. Yeah. So, uh, so I can... There's so much to say about this, uh, yeah. and uh, I, I was yeah, so happy when we need the bullet points I, now, yes, so we can the uh, start uh, juggling around with it. Yeah. So the the theoretic phase is the phase of progress. The second said. phase. Yeah. Oh, oh no, so, sorry. Uh, the first. Yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah. The theoretic phase is the only phase of uh, progress, right. because that's where you have a theoretical interest alone. And you uh, and you receive results by observing and testing and exp uh, and through your experience, and um, that is so successful, he says, that at some time, after some time, and that depends on how the situation is, uh, after some uh, on how long it lasts, but after some time is taken for granted. Right. And then instead of having that purely theoretical interest, you are observing nature to find answer. And there is a humbleness in that because you, you uh, acknowledge that you observe nature and you try to get answers from it. Mm. And you can actually uh, be wrong and then people can disprove you through using better arguments, better uh, observations, right. and then you improve. So that's how you improve uh, the uh, the philosophy. Yeah, in I, a way. I remember one one man I talked to once. He he had read this somewhere. Uh, no, actually, it might have been Rudolf Steiner who talked about it. In any case, the Greek attitude is that you have an idea according to, to, to the source, uh, and you present it. And when you present it, it's, it's no longer yours. It's like putting a rock on the table. Let me start describing the rock. And if you say that it's green from your side, I'm not offended by it, mm. <laughs> even though I put the rock there, right? Yeah. So you, you're sort of not moralistic. You're not, uh, you're not, it's not, uh, uh, what's the word, uh, offend, offense. You're not offen offended yeah. by it. Right? And uh, so... By, by the discussion of it. So that, uh, that, that's a very good, uh, very good uh, comparison. And that sounds much like science ought to be. Right. And that is the scientific method. So Brentano used that word, the scientific uh, method. And uh, uh, that is how science is supposed to be. Now we can see some traces of actually even science be starting to uh, having theses that are not supposed to be questioned and uh, results that are not uh, to proper to be published. Uh, but the true scientific method is supposed to be like that, that you can test it, you can uh, try it in any form. Mm. And so that is the theoretic phase. And he uh, uh, thinks that Aristotle, of course, then is the head of that uh, phase. But, um, but then it because it is so successful, 
it is taken for granted. And um, then when society gets in a situation, it can be different situations that require philosophy to be used for something else then you enter the practical phase. So that can be, for instance, um, because he, uh, he claims that there are, it has happened three times. And uh, so in the antiquities, in the Middle Ages, and now in modern times. Mm -hmm. and, um, and what is uh, also, before I continue with the practical uh, uh, phase, is that it's important to realize that this is a theory that he has made based on observations. He has read the history of philosophy and seen a trace and presents that. Mm. He doesn't say that this is how the world works metaphysically and you cannot right. do anything against it. He says, this is what I have observed and it looks like history repeats itself. Right. Uh, that is what he says. Right. Uh, and uh, so for instance, an example of the practic Phase is, uh, I, I think, the best example uh, is from the Middle Ages, actually, when there happened to be a, after Thomas Aquinas, which was on the theoretic phase, it ended up being a conflict between the Calvinist and the, uh, uh, well, I, I actually don't remember, but two churches mm -hmm. that were um, competing. And instead of then trying to find answers with a pure theoretical interest, there came another aspect in that was, well, we need to let our church win. Mm -hmm. Like we should have the best, right. uh, we should have the best philosophy and therefore we have to use uh, to make it more appealing to people. We have to make it uh, sound better. We have to do... So so ideology like comes in and not uh, so-called vested interest and not an empirical yeah. idea of, of what we have in front of us. Yeah, one can, one can say that. He calls it practical, case uh, practical uh, motives yeah. that enters into philosophy. And um, so when that has happened for a while, and, and in antiquities he uh, uh, points out uh, the st uh, Stoicism and uh, uh, Epicurus, that uh, bases the philosophy most on morality. So it becomes one-sided. But we don't have to go too mm. much into it. But mm. the point is that instead of researching nature and... The uh, basic principles or, or... Yeah. Yeah. And instead of having a theoretical interest, you have another interest. Right. It could be to serve your church, to serve some, some political issue. It could be to serve morality. Uh, and it ends up being not as successful. And people realize after some time that this is not working. This is not working that well. And mm. the philosophy said this, and then it said this, and it doesn't work. And then after a long while, it ends up in skepticism. So that's the third phase. Uh -huh. They're uh, represented by uh, Hume. A general skepticism of, of previous ideas or uh, it ends up uh, of course in different degrees some of it can be extreme skepticism that you cannot trust uh, any uh, uh, you cannot un uh, trust your senses you cannot trust your thinking you cannot trust right. anything we'll get and to that <laughs> yeah so it uh, it ends up being a skepticism towards everything and uh, that is very unfulfilling for uh, humans. So that is usually a phase that doesn't last too long. And then often he says is that the fourth phase, which is then the lowest point, is the mystical phase because then you have to conquer the skepticism. You, have, you cannot live as a human being with no answers. You need answers. And then you end up trying to overcome the skepticism on false grounds in a way, because you invent your own system to overreach the uh, skepticism. So instead of going back to just studying nature, 
you start inventing yes. stuff, just fantasy worlds or yes, because often the skepticism is at as a foundation. Mm -hmm. And how do you then overcome skepticism if it has said that you cannot trust your senses? So there's a longing for clear, uh, uh, unambiguous answers. Yeah. And you can find them more easily if it's a pure ideological attitude then. Mm, yeah, well, yes. If you don't have to sort of say, well, it doesn't fit, if you can say it doesn't fit reality, but that's not the point in any case. <laughs> yeah, it, he, he says, uh, as Aristotle does, that human longs for knowledge. Right. And therefore the skeptic phase is not fulfilling. Right. So then when the mystics... Uh, or the idealists have skepticism as their foundation. They try to overcome it by like taking a big leap over the skepticism. Right. So when they have said you cannot trust rationality, you cannot trust your senses and perception, then what do you trust? Well, I know it. There is something that is born within you right. that that you uh -huh. cannot okay. uh, discuss. So that is, for instance, what Immanuel Kant is doing with synthetic uh, a priori. Uh, priori. Yeah. Um, that he says that there are certain uh, that there are certain things that you are that you know without experience, right. and that is to be built upon further. Right. And uh, then, yeah, so, so he, uh, he uses the examples of uh, Immanuel Kant and uh, Hegel, especially. He's not very fond of them. No, he's not. Mm. And uh, so, so he says that it, was, it started with uh, Kant, uh, at least in a major way, and the low point really was with uh, Hegel. <laughs> and it had no scientific value whatsoever, uh, right. and that includes uh, Fichte and uh, Schelling and right. the other German idealists. And um, uh, the reason for that is that they, uh, uh, Kant, for instance, he says, forces one to believe in um, to believe in something that is invented that cannot be proven or right. disproven. Right. And that can continue for, um, you can take that pretty far. I was thinking to try to um, draw an analogy to uh, what has happened within painting. Mm. Because as far as I can tell, uh, if we stick to modern times, the Renaissance would be the theoretic phase, according to, to Bretano. Mm -hmm. You actually l study nature, you have the central perspective, uh, you know, going into to um, dissect corpses to find anatomy, the correct anatomy. It, it, everything is about finding out how things really are and having a solid basis for what you do, composition, and everything. And uh, we were talking about it in, in the Cave of Palace team and, and the, our producer was, was saying that uh, and that really made me think, because that's also something to, to, to talk about, how after, you know, with Michelangelo, he is such a force. And then you get people who just sort of lean on that uh, formula that he presents, so, so to speak. And you get mannerism, mm. where they almost don't study nature anymore, but they just sort of follow the, you know, the sort of Michelangelo-esque way of doing things. And that's when they are, when they, well, they, they are practical about it, right? Yep. There's a recipe, you can use it. And so, so to clarify, I'm not against recipes, but if you only look at the recipe and not on nature, that's when you get, well, the practical phase mm. or the practical phase, I guess. But then you have Caravaggio, who sort of pulls it back and is criticized for always having to, to, uh, having to use models. Mm. He cannot paint without models. And that's a ridiculous thing. And they, they criticize him for that. Mm -hmm. um, but then you can say what happens in, in painting generally, uh, it goes back to so the practice phase. And, and I think the, the, the um, uh, academic painting 
is a fairly good example of that, where you have these things that are based on uh, uh, Renaissance painters who be that become formulaic in the sense that they stop looking at nature enough and it shall, shall look like a painting and shall, shall not be uh, as alive. Mm. Um, or that becomes the consequence at least. And then you get into, I guess, the, the skeptic phase when you're skeptical of all of this, and that's where you're starting, starting to get this sort of, well, one thing is naturalism, but you also get, get this realism. I mean, the typical example would be Corbet, that we, we have talked about earlier. I don't know if we talked about it in the last conversation, but where he says that I uh, will not paint angels because I've never seen one. Mm. And that's sort of very sort of quote-unquote rational, <laughs> very scientific, but then he kills the whole idea that is behind the whole um, Greek or Roman way of thinking, which is to create drama. That's why you study all of these things, you know. When you have a, a painter studying a, a guy standing with a stick, that's because, well, he can rest his arm, so you can study him, right? Mm. It's just a study. But when you start making paintings where the point is to show a man with standing with a stick, then you've lost the point of why you're doing it. Yeah. Right? I mean, it's like uh, one student I had. He said he was in the military when they were doing the the, the um, some some um, uh, what do you call it maneuvers. One guy should stand on the highest hill and hold his hand like this, mm -hmm. and then it's sort of I think it was a captain investigated into why why should they stand there. It turns out he should be stand there and hold the the what do you call it the, uh, you know hold the horse of the the general but the horse was gone and he was still standing there you know and that's when you get into just following rules and not yeah. looking at, at reality anymore huh. and obviously when you get into uh, this, that whole rejection of craft because it cannot leave you anywhere because you, know, you look at what the what the academic painting led to hmm. then it's a full skepticism of craft as such and you go into this mystic way of thinking for example like uh, in, in with Kandinsky right hmm. where the painting doesn't prove itself you are you project all that deep content into it but it's not on the surface of the painting right hmm. I think that's it seems to me at least from what what uh, the little I've read of Brentano what you've been talking about that that's sort of an equivalent uh, yeah. development or or, or not develop. I mean, we get caught in these words. I mean, yeah. develop is like it's got better and better and better, right? Yeah. The the only phase where development happens is the theoretic theoretic phase, phase. and then it's it goes downhill. Down. Yes. But then and then you have also that question of well, uh, uh, is uh, how how do you get from the mystic phase back to the theoretic phase? Then? Yeah. Hmm. Well, just just to comment on uh, on what you said uh, about the comparing it to to painting, mm. I, um, I, I, I think I agree with uh, the examples that you used. Maybe, maybe, uh, maybe skeptic. Maybe the skeptic phase is something different uh, mm. because I, the the Renaissance is the theoretic, as you said, studying nature, and then it becomes practical and uh, just uh, uh, these academic paintings, <coughs> and then it loses its value. People see that well, this is actually not giving me anything uh, so but maybe the skeptic phase is the uh, like the pointless abstractions mm -hmm. instead of the uh, what was his name again the Kandinsky uh, no, no the, uh, Corbet. Corbet yes Corbet, Corbet. Yeah, yeah. maybe that's the skeptic phase and then it turn goes into the mystic phase when it uh, builds upon something uh, that is just uh, invented. You mean like conceptual art or? Yes, conceptual or something that serves uh, some political uh, uh, some political goal or something. I mm -hmm. don't know, but maybe I've, uh, I'm, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure, but it's, uh, it's, it's, it's fun to talk about. Um, right. and, um, and another uh, important thing to remember with the cycle is that this is for philosophy. It's not for the world as a whole. So right. one, uh, he says it's a bit different the development in science because science, when using the scientific method, moves forward, uh, but it can move 
less forward if it is weakened and then it but then it continues again uh, it depends on right so i mean he's not talking about an inevitable uh, progress <laughs> yeah <laughs> that, that's what we have to understand all the time right? yeah because i i what i was thinking about I, or did you want to say something no i was uh, just uh, 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 thinking that and the same for culture that it it's not necessarily that when the theoretic phase is in philosophy it has to be the high point right. uh, in culture because in but it's natural, but it doesn't have to be. Uh, in uh, music and, and painting, and this is one thing I talked with uh, Boris Kohler about, uh, music and painting you have the different stages at the same time. I mean, the, the really peak of music, in, in, you can argue in many ways, is the 19th century, right? Yeah. And that is, you know, depending on when, but I mean, the second half of the 19th century would be, I would think, the skeptical phase mm -hmm. of, of painting, you know, but then you really get huge drama, huge uh, intensity in this great orchestral works, the symphonies, right? Yeah. So, uh, uh, of course, I would think it's, uh, if one studies it, uh, I, I think one could find uh, a, uh, a similar uh, trace uh, mm. if you see how does philosophy develop and how does culture... Uh, I, I would think it's natural that philosophy leads the way the culture follows after, yeah. maybe, and then comes the... Uh, general society or politics. General society. Or, yeah. uh, but you have uh, Ayn Rand's idea that the man who controls philosophy controls the culture. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's yeah. that's a sort of side... Uh, that's n another big discussion, right? Yeah. Um, but I was thinking about... So, so it's really clarified that, that it's not an inev inevitable uh, cycle that has to be fulfilled. Mm -hmm. um, because one thing that really struck me... To, for, I mean, we're just sort of going here and there. Uh, to talk about Hegel, his uh, philosophy of world history is quite... I was really quite shocked when I read it. Because he's talking about how um, there, there you have the... Well, that would be the... the, well, the, the well, obviously the mystic phase. He is talking about that there is a will there is a master plan for history. Mm. And he is saying that he's sort of equating it with, um, is that the term providence? You know, the God's plan with, with uh, this world. Mm -hmm. uh, in any case, he's equating it with, with God in many ways. But he's saying we cannot use examples from religion because we have to be empirical and, sh and show that this has happened. Mm -hmm. But then it just posits like, sort of on the, on the side there, it says, well, there is a will in history. There is a direction, but then we have to find all the proof. Yeah, he doesn't prove the 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 the, the basis of it. Mm. Doesn't show. I mean, it just just states that, and then he tries to find you know, all the evidence. Is is, the, is how he describes it. Right? Mm. And I, I was thinking um, that is a completely different way of thinking because then you're not in on the theoretic phase. You're not looking at reality. And that I talked with um, with uh, uh, you know, in the previous previous program with uh, Jamal Knudsen Ujil uh, about how this Hegelian idea of progress, which is sort of just destroy that word for <laughs> the unforeseeable future, mm -hmm. um, that creates by necessity a devil, because the positive thing is to go forward, and so if someone then does not go forward go backward and this is uh, these are mystical terms right so you cannot mm. say you cannot actually look at someone does he go forward or backward <laughs> you know it's, it's just not ideological choice so if someone then goes backwards he becomes satan and this is what Hermann brock the the kitsch critic is talking about he's saying that this uh, kitsch person who is doesn't follow the times who paints on old-fashioned who paints dramatic stories is sentimental in, in what he is he's creating lies to the audience he is the say he is uh satan and that is not a metaphor he says hmm. and i think then you can safely say that you are in the mystic phase because there's no way to disprove that that is that is pure ideology right hmm. you think that's a fair yeah. description yeah and it's also um um it's also one of the uh followers of Hegel, uh, 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 Danto, 
he also used uh, Hegel's theories into uh, the famous quote uh, or the famous uh, book. Oh, the book saying after the end of art. Yes, the end of art. Right. Just that the end of art, mm. something reaching an end point. Right. And he's he is very brutal because he. Uh, he writes something that it's impossible to produce what he calls art, which is the uh, which is really kitsch, but uh, which is the art as uh, portrays of philosophical uh, ideas and of right. uh, uh, archetypical uh, images and something universal portraying something universal that is not uh, possible anymore for art because and then there's some answers that philosophy has taken over or the state has taken over or the yeah. church or whatever well that that's but, the, yeah that's the example uh, from that book where he quotes a painter who writes him and this is so central i have maybe you've worn it out that, that example, but it's very fundamental to, and it shows the skeptic mind, uh, the, the, the the mystic mind. Um, where this painter writes to him and says, I only try to paint like Rembrandt. Why am I so criticized? And he says, Oh, you can do that. That's no problem. But you have to do it with irony because we live in our times. Mm. And that is not an empirical, ra re reason based argument. You cannot point us to, to the argument and say, that is why you can't do it. I mean, if I tell you, you want to paint with glasses, and I can say, well, they won't stick to the brush, they won't stick to the canvas. Well, that, that's an empirical question, right? Mm. <laughs> so that's, that's, that's obviously not, obviously not possible. Yeah. But as long as you're able to hold a brush, if you're not sick, if you have an arm, you can hold the brush, you can mix colors and apply them to a canvas. Mm. And that would be the theoretic approach then. Yeah. Because I mean, that's one thing which is so, Amazing with with uh, with uh, Aristotle, amazing from uh, from the perspective of this of this time, uh, is that he, as opposed to Kant, he talks about, you know, how can you create uh, an, an, uh, a story which is as gripping as possible? Okay, well, these things are gripping. How can you reach that? Hmm. What do you have to take care of to reach that? He doesn't say now you should you shouldn't do that. Because yeah. that's what's Kant, what Kant does, right? Mm -hmm. Just sets up a moral imperative. You shouldn't do that. Yeah. And that has nothing to do with what is practically, um, well, empirically possible. Mm. Right? Yeah, and that, that also relates back to uh, the, the introduction of the cycle, is that the theoretical phase uh, creates uh, theories out of how nature is. So, for mm. instance, seeing that, well, this is how it is, and that's something I can try to find out of mm. instead of presenting a theory, presenting an idea yeah. and saying this is how the world is yeah. and doing everything in one's power to show that it is that way. Like mm. Hegel yeah. or the Hegelians saying yeah. this is the end of art. It, the progress has reached a certain point and right. now it's the end. Let me show you how it is so instead of finding that out if that, or, or finding an answer by observing and trying to find an answer, sometimes being humble and saying, maybe I don't have enough answers uh, or enough uh, knowledge to answer that. Right. Instead, they have this idea and they force it on the world. And then you have that the typical psychological issue where the, the less you know, the more... Uh, um, the more you stand on that principle. Yeah. That happens very often. Hmm. There is one uh, that is related uh, to uh, Brentano's uh, criticism of German idealism, and that is uh, uh, a Norwegian, not famous at all. Um, he was a, a, a lawyer, but also a philosopher, uh, Anton Schweigor. And uh, I, I have his book here. He wrote one, as I know of, philosophical piece in his youth. He was a, yeah. a wonder child. Uh, and uh, he wrote it on German philosophy. It's really worth reading. It's, uh, uh, it, it has a lot of the youthful power in it, uh, talking about how 
the uh, idealist philosophy has no value whatsoever and it's just uh, humbug and it's uh, and, and this was his uh, he wrote this in 1835 or something so he was he found Holy that cow. out early and uh, he he said something uh, wrote something that was very interesting and that is that in the mystic phase he, he doesn't use that, those terms but right. in german idealism you have absolute knowledge you have absolute knowledge of, of something whatever that means while instead of having knowledge which was what philosophy used to be <laughs> so it's knowledge 2.0 <laughs> yes you have absolute uh, absolute knowledge and so he says the german idealist says and then he quotes um absolute knowledge exists therefore we must uh, obtain it or something or therefore yeah. we can obtain it so posit something and then it's true and you have to find it yes while the empirical way is absolute knowledge cannot be obtained therefore it's relevant it's it's nothing or or you could even ask is it possible i'll try to find out <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. But uh, yeah. yeah, and then you present it, and then someone says, "Well, you forgot this and this." Oh shit! <laughs> and 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 we can see that repeats itself on several. But the the uh, I would say the baseline for everything is that uh, that you're searching for the absolute knowledge of uh, of something. Right, and that's and that is the the modernist or the art way of thinking. You have, well, we'll get to this with the zeitgeist uh, thing, but when you have seen through, this is a skeptic, you have seen through and revealed that paint is just paint. Mm -hmm. Oh, so it's a lie to put it together so it looks like a face. Yeah. And then you re re feel really proud, right? I mean, mm -hmm. it's, it's a, I mean, it's that, that, you know, that phrase, no shit, Sherlock. Uh, no, I mean, we know that, right? Yeah. <laughs> but hey, speaking of that, I wanted to get some, to some questions from the audience, but please, please, can you tell that story about Buddha that you learned from yes. the monk, the yes. Buddhist monk? Uh, it's hilarious, <laughs> please. Yeah, this uh, this relates to um, uh, to the mystic phase in the way that uh, the mystic phase often try to uh, to create a meaning or an existence or something absolute like mm. the thing in itself and everything <clears throat> like that uh, behind what you can observe that is existing behind it in yeah, the real truth. strange yes the real thing or the real something and uh, uh, that could be an idea or a truth or whatever and um, that can be connected to uh, for instance the statues that they are tearing down uh, now it's they are tearing down the idea behind yes. the statue. Right. Not That's the ironic, by the way, that they have to attack the statue to get the idea behind it, which doesn't exist. Yeah. Or it's not material. It's not there. <laughs> <laughs> That's, yeah. Okay. And, uh, and it's the same with the iconoclast. They didn't yeah. tear down things yeah. because they didn't like the look of it. It was because the idea behind it, they, yeah, yeah. they yeah. firmly believed. They were not that envious. Their, oh. No. Uh, and that they firmly believe that there was something existing in that sculpture and therefore it was necessary to destroy it. Right. And um, the, the idea of not portraying one's uh, God right. has been uh, in many religions. And I found out when I attended... Uh, I, uh, uh, I went uh, to some, uh, not classes, but teachings uh, from a Buddhist uh, uh, Lama, mm. uh, Tibetan Lama. Lama. And uh, he, uh, he said something very interesting, that there had been the same prohibition of um, uh, portraying the Buddha. That's, in, that surprised me when you told yes, me. Yes, in very early Tibet, right. they were not allowed to portray the Buddha. Mm. And then he said that Tibet, in one way or another, got in touch with uh, Greece. Mm. And 
from there they learned how to uh, or they they saw the value of portraying the human mm. uh, or to portray nature and then he said that uh, what we learned from the Greeks was that uh, it had a value to portray uh, nature and um, and then he said in a in his very funny accent that uh, that um, well the reason why you don't portray uh, you're not supposed to portray the god is because you're not supposed to uh, to um, to believe that you actually can portray a god but what is the worst thing to create a sculpture of the buddha that everyone knows is not the buddha <laughs> and then he pointed to a large buddha sculpture that was in the room everyone knows that the buddha is not sitting there so what is worse to have a sculpture of Buddha and pray to him, but you know it's not Buddha. <laughs> or to have a fixed idea of Buddha that you think is the absolute truth. Which might be completely wrong. Yes. That was... Uh, that so they, uh, I, I really love uh, Buddhist uh, teaching. They uh, have a way of yeah, yeah. simplifying I mean, so the very uh, d uh, difficult questions. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it reminds me of a friend of mine who's an engineer. He was part of a, a group and they had spent millions trying to f get water from one basin to another, whatever, a lot, yeah, millions. And then he sat there, it's a board meeting, you know, 12 people. He sat there, well, why do you, don't you just take a tube from this to this, put it lower down so the water can run? Oh, <laughs> you could have saved them millions of crowns. All right. Uh, <clears throat> Here is a, uh, a question to you from our top patron, whose name you've already mentioned, Adara mm. Uh So, what is your and Brentano's opinion about a civilization finding itself at several stages at the same time? That the possibility of highs and lows in the culture can take place simultaneously? Um, yeah, that's... Um that is one of the face uh, or one of the issues where I agree with uh, Brentano. Uh, he, since he is not metaphysical or not right. idealistic, yeah. he says that happens all the time, and that's the common thing. So, for instance, uh, the ancient uh, extreme uh, skeptic Pyrrho, he lived at the time of Alexander the Great, which was Aristotle's time. Right. which is the theoretic phase. Yeah, yeah. But he was not very popular at that time. Uh, so it took time before his works became uh, like flourished and, and, uh, and became celebrated. And that was in the skeptic phase. Right. So it can exist uh, alongside each other, but there is still, uh, it, it shows what uh, are the... Uh, how can I say, what are the leading philosophical ideas of that time? Hmm. Um, and one can see that within painting and everything. There, There is something that is the leading trend in the way, but there can exist uh, people that paint different to that trend. Right, and the thing about music compared to painting in the late uh, 19th century, yeah. or you, for instance, don't exactly follow the trend in That's painting. What? <laughs> I am insulted. Um, so here is a, uh, a uh, question from, I think, a patron. Um, since there was an Aristotelian Renaissance in the 19th, in 19th century Germany, coexisting with the art religion of pietist spirit, what can you say about Franz Bentano being a Catholic? who interpreted Aristotle's metaphysics in scholastic terms uh, in response to Protestant, Protestant German idealism. Mm, could you repeat that question, That just the last uh, part of it? What can you say about Franz Brentano being a Catholic who interpreted uh, Aristotle's metaphysics in scholastic terms in response to Protestant German idealism? Hmm. 
I don't know that much about his... Uh, I, I I knew that he was a Catholic and right. was uh, supposed to be a, a priest, no. but I don't know much about... But uh, from what you've read, there's nothing specifically Catholic or Christian in his... There are at some... Least, yeah. At least not in, in the, this, these phases. This is pure no, empirical studies. But. Not in the phases there, uh, that I've uh, seen. There are uh, some... Uh, some uh, traces of uh, of religion there uh, in his other writings as I've seen uh, as he's also very influenced by Thomas Aquinas for instance but mm. um, and I'm, I'm sure he has works on on religion but not I'm, I'm not sure how uh, to to say how that was a reaction against right. uh, the uh, uh, German. okay um, here's a question from Facebook Mm -hmm. uh, which individu individuals from history representing the theoretic phase does Brentano highlight? And does Koshnes have some good examples in mind? Yeah. Well, uh, the, the ones that Brentano uh, highlights uh, is, uh, as mentioned, Aristotle in the ancient uh, uh, Greece. That is his, uh, that is his highlight. Uh, and then he has the second uh, period, which is the Middle Ages, and then he uh, finds an Aristotelian, the uh, Thomas Aquinas, and he uh, studied him uh, very thoroughly as well. And then in modern time, the third cycle, then he uh, presents uh, uh, René uh, Descartes and uh, Francis Bacon mm -hmm. that had the uh, scientific method of how to do uh, philosophy right and uh, of course there are several others to uh, to uh, mention um, I, I would say that I agree with uh, Brentano as as far as I've thought about it uh, now in who to um, highlight in the history of philosophy um, but there are several other areas where there also are people with a theoretical mindset empirical in a mindset, way yeah. yes uh, yeah. an empirical and theoretical mindset and of course there are many of them in uh, in science for instance um, just to mention one example that is illustrating uh, because almost all good scientists are in the theoretical uh, uh, phase or the theoretical uh, mindset and uh, it's interesting how uh, to use two examples, Isaac Newton and Albert Einstein. And when Albert Einstein presented his uh, theory of relativity, that was a point that showed that, well, Newton was wrong on his theories of physics. But it doesn't disprove the whole idea of Newton. You cannot trust because, me at all. <laughs> no, it was just that uh. Uh, Albert Einstein found uh, some aspects of uh, some observations that made him able to find out that, well, the rules that Isaac Newton said are not complete. You could do them, you can describe them more thoroughly through the theory of relativity. This is right. overly simple. So that is uh, one of the fantastic benefits of the theoretical mindset that right. you actually can take from others and you can improve it and uh, yes, and, and build upon it further instead of the mystical mindset, the idealistic mindset. Mm. If one disproves uh, that, well, Hegel was actually wrong about zeitgeist. And the whole fundament. The whole yeah. fundament uh, goes to uh, falls apart, but you're not supposed to do that. And uh, yeah, so in science, there's so many examples to uh, to bring forth. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking also in if I can just mention a couple. Of, uh, please mention more afterwards if you want. But uh, I'm thinking specifically about two people when it comes to painters. There's one thing that I noticed that John Constable said. Mm. He said that. Um, you know, being a landscape painter, landscape painting should be judged as a part of the natural sciences 
and each landscape should be judged as an experiment or investigation into the laws of nature. Mm. And I was thinking, if that had gotten uh, become established, then you might have criticism for you know painting too loose or whatever, too painterly because it should be top topographically correct. But you wouldn't have a situation where painting as such was a problem, mm. right? And the other is uh, is Andrew Wyeth. Yeah. Uh, in in well, he died in two thousand nine, but it's it's our age, right? Mm. And there's a documentary or an interview with him. I don't remember the exact quote, but it talks about that he wishes that uh, that only his eyes could be present and just watch. You know that 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 he was not there, that he could just watch and uh, see what's going on, look at the motif and sort of paint it, <clears throat> mm. but that his personality should not be there. Mm. And and that is that strikes me as a really sort of the theoretical approach. And I don't know if you saw that interview that I made with uh, that we made with with uh, Cheng Wu. Oh yes, and my, that my struck, favorite struck me. Yes, yeah. I learned so much from that. And and that struck me also when he talked about. I'll not try to say the Chinese words. The different phases, the, their sort of their Renaissance, you know, tenth century with Li Qing the name that they would use was I am not there. And then when it starts to generate into mm. pure colors, the big signatures and all these things, then it is me is there. Mm. And that's sort of, then you're not occupied with looking at nature anymore. You're just looking at yourself in the mirror. Well, not barely that, you're just looking at the mirror in your, your own brain, right? Yeah. Yeah, I, uh, I think that's really one of the uh, core issues in uh, in today's aesthetics that need to express oneself. Uh, I, uh, I, I had a presentation in, um, uh, on the last uh, track yes. conference, the representational art conference. And, that was uh, a nice one. Yeah, and... Um, and people uh, can find that on YouTube. Yes, yeah, they can. Yeah. And uh, my main example is, uh, uh, um, is uh, Homer. Yeah. And that people actually uh think that he didn't exist or they question the scientists uh, or researchers are like oh is this a real person did he ever exist that must be the prime example of someone who doesn't uh, put their own voice into the work and uh, that was what aristotle said that's why he is the number one poet it's because he doesn't put him his own voice into uh, the work right and um, um, uh, yeah and so back to the theoretic the examples that's uh, it's a very good uh, it's a very good parallel to to bring forth the not having your own voice into it because that makes it uh, that resonates much with the name theoretic um, but also uh, also the word empirical is sometimes a better word because there is so many, uh, you can have so many, uh, how can I say, views about what theoretic is. Like so many, you're told what is supposed to be theoretic while it might be actually mystical. So for instance, in uh, music, I would say that one of the, uh, one of the, the a theoretic mindset in music among composers. I would say one of the prime examples is Rachmaninoff. How so? But then what would, would think easily think that well, how he's theoretic, he's just romantic and yeah, it's just uh, a lot of emotions. Right? A lot of emotions. <laughs> and but uh, listen to all these other Schoenberg and uh, all this. Uh, they have so much theory behind mm. what they uh, are doing with the uh, modernist uh, atonal uh, uh, music. Mm. But I would claim the uh, complete opposite because and but then it's perhaps better to use the word empiric uh, instead of theoretic mm. um, because he uses nature when composing in the sense of using the human mind, the human emotional system. He has studied the past and studied composers and actually tried to evoke feelings uh, in his audience. 
That's the Aristotelian approach. Then. Yes, that's the Aristotelian, the theoretic approach. But it's not what one is uh, taught what is supposed to be the theoretical. But then think about what then is this atonal music that is supposed to be theoretical. It's basically just ideas that are put out there that are said that, well, music is supposed to be... Tones, uh, tones in space, I heard yes. the composer said. Okay. Yes, okay, yeah. yeah. And therefore one should make it mm. instead of... Uh, so you're, as the mystics do, present an idea of how it should be and then make force reality or force the outer world to respond to that idea instead of going... Comply with it. Yes, yes, yeah. to, to comply with it yeah. instead of going the opposite way of having... You, you know what, or you know at least some of how human emotions uh, react, and you know that uh, that is one of the uh, purposes of music. And therefore you use that, you use your knowledge the best as you can to create harmony and sometimes disharmony, to come back to harmony again. And you know that will awake uh, emotions and you use that from nature and create music. Right. And that is, I would say, a theoretical approach or an empirical To accept and not approach. moralize that human beings need these representations of emotions, that's the empirical standpoint. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, and uh, and I think to to go back to your question on how to then get from the mystic phase and go back to the theoretic. That's a an important question. Important question, and it's uh, uh, and it's difficult. Uh, Brentano thought himself that he had a solution, and his solution was what he called empirical psychology, and he thought that he was leading the way to this new wave going back or not back but up to the theoretical phase again i wouldn't say that he succeeded uh, because it in many ways we are still in the mystical uh, phase today at least when considering how much hegel are still read uh, and then i mean especially his followers that uh, many of the followers, especially in uh, uh, history, in, uh, in in political philosophy, but also in so many in uh, aesthetics, his uh, Hegel's and his followers are read widely, and Immanuel Kant are very highly respected in most universities. And uh, well, you have also um, uh, the thing about Danto, yeah, where he talks about the Museum of Monochrome paintings, where the old paintings. Paintings are exactly the same, but they're made for different reasons. Yeah. So therefore they are different. And that is pure mysticism for you. Yeah. Because then there is the ideas. Not that, the object, not reality, but... Yeah. And they have monopoly. It's not The ideas, if everything is uh, empirically the same, it's only the ideas, the so-called ideas that change and that's what is important. And then the empirical has no in in that example. So, but how can it then? Yeah, go how it up can? Again? Um, I'm just to follow up on uh, on Brentano, who he he said that it was through when the mystical phase takes it so far that philosophy ha no longer have a value, and so then one needs to go back to older philosophers to build up a new system mm. and he went back to aristotle and um so so that was what he thought was the solution but then again he didn't seem to succeed and i'm i'm unsure why that was so um and of course, one can point to uh, things happening uh, in the society, uh, the world wars or something like that. I, I don't know. But it, it could also be that in some ways he seemed to, maybe I'm too harsh now, but he seemed to play on the um, mystics field using terms mm. sometimes that... Uh, too diplomatic? Uh, no, not, not too diplomatic, but that he uh, sometimes seemed to not... Um, uh, maybe... 
uh, how can I phrase it? Well, f f to use a specific example, he he says that uh, through um, through your senses, he says, you cannot reach absolute knowledge, and that is because he is not concerned with absolute knowledge. But then again, uh, because he thinks that it should be as it was in in the theoretical phase, everything is treated as hypothesis that we study nature, we observe something, we make a theory, and this is how it seems to be. And then people can uh, uh, react to that, and it can they can try to develop the theory uh, as the scientific method. So therefore, he says that you don't reach absolute truths. But by using the term absolute truth, mm. you play on the mystics uh, like uh, field right. so instead of ignoring what is irrelevant. So, uh, so not using sort of the well, political correct terminology is one way of getting back to the theoretic yeah, or, phase then. Yeah, or uh, at least... I mean, I, I, I was thinking, what if someone, some historian wrote a book on the history of painting without mentioning the, sort of the typical, it's getting better and better and better, mm -hmm. just, look at, just looking at the really good pictures throughout history without caring about when mm. or if it should develop this or that way. Yeah. Totally ahistorical. Mm -hmm. But I have to say, I think sometimes the answer lies straight under your nose. Because one thing I would, would say at least is that, and this is related to that point, not using the terminology, which is, which is uh, uh, no, the normal terminology. What you're doing here with the, with the civilization mm -hmm. and, uh, is to highlight the positive examples. Mm. Think positive <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah yeah definitely and um, there are so many examples but um, and and I will bring forth one that is uh, featured in the uh, yeah. in the well, magazine yep I think I know which one you're talking about yeah go on and sure. uh, that is a college in uh, in Australia called the Scots College and they are actually replacing a modernist building with a Scottish uh, barony castle, in a way. And it, it has faced so much uh, ridicule and so many people have been against it for uh, all kinds of reasons. But um, they are still, they're still doing it. And we uh, uh, interviewed the... Um, both the principal of the college and and the one that had been the head of the uh, like building uh, department at the college, and um, they had some really clear answers. They were so they were like untouched by zeitgeist. Beautiful. That is beautiful. <laughs> In a way, so for instance, um, uh, they say that they had. Um, several offers from architectural offices that uh, presented okay so we are rebuilding the library how will we do it and the current one is in concrete it's gray and it's square and it's uh, outdated from the 60s or something and one of the firms had suggested to let the building stay and incorporate it into glass have it like encapsulated a, yes in encapsulated in okay. glass and then plant some trees on top does it sound familiar <laughs> it's like every uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. that's what everyone does nowadays and then the principal asked so what part of this design uh, of this design represents the heritage of the scots college and and uh, uh, and they couldn't answer right. and then they finally admitted that, well, it's basically just what everyone else does. That's what they yes, straight out said. Yes, that's what they answered. I, I have it written black, uh, like... Uh, that's uh, black pure mysticism. Yes. yes. Because then there's no theoretic reason, there's no empirical reason. It's just what everybody else does. Yeah. And, um, and that is what... Um, 
that is that is i think the the way to answer to the mysticism mm. is to actually try to uh, or to actually point to the outer world to point to reality s- <laughs> yes yes reality and and to point so so for instance when when danto says that following hegel that it's the end of art and you cannot make universal paintings anymore right <clears throat> then make a universal yeah. painting right and you cannot build in a uh, well you can say a universal way or an old fashioned way anymore because it has developed well then just do as the scots college in australia because it's physically it. possible yes it's just do it and then you have disproven it and of course, the uh, the mystics, the Hegelians, and everything would say that well, it's that's not proof enough and everything, but it is. <laughs> and um, um, there is uh, one thing that is um, that I think is very n- nicely said by uh, Schweigor uh, is that the idealists, the German idealists, have made the philosopher into something else than the honorable the honorable man that he used to be because now according to the german idealist the philosopher is supposed to know everything mm. is supposed to know the absolute truth while the honorable man that philosophers used to be was to acknowledge that one doesn't know anything uh, one doesn't know everything and also admitting the limits of the knowledge uh, admitting that uh, where they got their information from and also admitting that sometimes it is a suggestion instead of a description of uh, truth and to be an honorable man and uh, that is uh, uh, that is an aspect that is uh, important to try to try to bring bring back to to philosophy and um, yeah and, uh, and I'm thinking about <clears throat> I just want to mention one example uh, sample and I'll give you I'll give you the chance for a famous last word um, that's one a, a painter talked to me about that once where he said that what generally happens uh, and this is my recounting of the story is that Painters come to, for example, to study these things in the university, figurative painting. And then they are met with this sort of deconstructive attitude where, because we, this is Kant, obviously, we cannot know reality. So how do you think that you can paint reality when you don't know what reality is? Hmm. And so they use that sort of, it's a, like a mental Trojan horse to to uh, disintegrate the, the, the fact that you know that you can study things and you can improve Mm. so your point is do it yeah (laughs) yeah exactly and 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 then if you if you have that uh more uh through having that more humble uh attitude you can actually answer uh the questions that the principal asked for instance if you base the uh architecture or painting, or politics, or whatever, if you base it on something that is uh, observable, something that can be, uh, that can be uh, refuted without destroying like the whole metaphysical system, but just trying to improve it. If you have that attitude towards uh, philosophy, and use that in the painting in architecture and when the principal then asks a simple question so what part Mm. of the project that you have presented to me represents the heritage of the scots college because i guess that was in the task like make a building that represents the heritage then you should be able to answer it Mm -hmm. So it's uh, it's uh, interesting that actually it it can sound as a, it, it may sound as a way of um, uh, as something weak in a way to be that humble, but uh, I I like better the way honorable 
mm. because then through that humble or honorable uh, attitude you actually find answers so right. you can answer you have a product and you have then made something that would probably be an attempt to uh, to um, uh, to show the heritage of the school or whatever it is mm. then you can point to well i've used elements from the uh, Scottish nature or something, I've uh, used the traditional architecture, or if you're supposed to paint, uh, to paint uh, a portrait uh, or something, it's uh, then you have used the archetypical images of this and that, and you can actually defend what you have done. Right. But if you are a mystic, it would be easy to just get into the trap and say, well, it's what everyone else does. Unless you are a philosopher and say that you can have the absolute truth and that's how it is. But if you don't have that education and you're, a, uh, yeah, and you're an architect, then that's what mysticism leads to, right. doing what everyone else does. And I was thinking also, it, one should never forget that it is ironically to the advantage of someone furthering classical values that a mystic is really self-assure because they don't do not know actually what they're doing they don't investigate enough and but we have to think mm. really think through what we're doing yeah. and that is a really really an, an advantage in a situation like that mm. Carl Koshnes, this has been pure joy thank you for coming back to the cable palace thank you very much thank you for watching Remember, you can support our show at patreon.com slash cableappellus. I'll see you next month.